Uh, let me try this. I did not take it. Uh, switch profiles. So let me try it again. Well, it says, uh, do you guys see it on there? Yeah, do you see it? Dad's looking for it now. Because I might just be getting the error, and it might actually be there, because I'm looking at it, it seems to be there. He puts a hit fellowship, right? You're, it's going to be on, on your um, oh, fellowship. fellowship. Yep. Yeah, I see y'all. Yep, we're good. Okay, let me just say okay. All right, so, all right. Let me start our recording. All right, well, let me know if it disappears. And if it does, you uh, you should be able to share it. We'll figure it out. Um, good morning, everybody. To God be the glory for the great things he has done. Uh, it's good to be with you all again, and we're going to say, even though we're on Zoom, it's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Um, Amen. Open up with a word of prayer. And just so you guys know, I think I said it before, I use two screens. So if you see me looking to the left, I'm just looking at the other screen. <laughs> it helps me when I uh, facilitate. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I come before you as humble as I know how. First of all, Lord, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Prepare me, O oh Lord, to teach your lesson. Prepare your people to receive, O oh God. O oh Lord, we ask that you forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us all from all our unrighteousness. Prepare our heart, mind, body, and soul. Lord, we give thanks to everyone that is here and everyone that will ever hear this Sunday school lesson. Bless them, Lord, as only you can. Continue to be with Dr. Thompson as she continues to heal and be with Brother Tony Dixon as he continues to go through his treatments. Just bless them, O oh Lord. Keep them. And we even say a special prayer for Brother Kearney Thompson. O oh Lord, just ask that you just continue to bless him and watch over him and strengthen him. Again, Lord, we ask that you bless our time together. Amen. Again, I say good morning. Um, I do have kind of a, a funny story to tell you guys this morning. Uh, I started studying the lesson, and uh, somehow or another, I studied uh, uh, the wrong passage of Scripture. <laughs> and I didn't figure it out until this morning that I had studied the wrong passage of Scripture. Uh, I started studying Hebrews chapter 9, um, and probably when I <laughs> looked at the chapter, I started with the verse that we're going to start with, which is verse nine. So um, bear with me as we go through today's lesson. That's why I don't have a PowerPoint is because I just put this together um, this morning. So uh, y'all pray for me and pray with me. Amen. Um, today's lesson um, is um, a, um, full assurance. That is the name of our lesson today, full assurance. It comes from the book of Hebrews. Uh, our scripture lesson is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 20, and the background scripture was the same. Our devotional reading was a very familiar scripture to all of us, Psalms 23. Uh, I hope you had an opportunity to read that. Um, Psalms 23, I, I know most of us know, but I hope when you look at it in context of today's lesson, you got a better appreciation for it. Um, today's lesson, as I say, it comes from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is an epistle, which means letter, and was written in the Pauline style. While the author is unknown, many believe that the apostle Paul is the author. It is believed that the book of Hebrews was written somewhere between 67 and 69 AD. While the author's name is never mentioned, the recipients of the letter certainly knew uh, who he was, who, who was the writer of the book. And we get a glimpse of that in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 22 through 24. And it says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. 
know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all of them that have rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. So that is certainly written from someone whom they knew, uh, especially since he did not, the author did not give his name. And, and, and you know, reading that, those three little verses, one might assume that Paul wrote it. It was certainly written in the style of Paul. Um, uh, there are various ways to outline the book. One way is in the term of five passages of warning. These five are Hebrews chapter two, verses one through four, uh, chapter three, seven um, through four, 13, uh, chapter five, 11 through chapter six, verse 12, chapter 10, uh, verses 19 through 39, and chapter 12, 14 to 29. Each warning section includes a call to salvation and a vivid description of the consequences if God's way is rejected. Today's text includes part of the third warning. This passage consists of four sections split between negative and positive appeals. Hebrews chapter 5, 11 through 14 is a warning and is offset by the encouragement found in today's lesson. Our lesson today, as I said, comes from chapter six. This is part of the discourse on spiritual growth, which starts at chapter five, verse 11. Um, and verses uh, nine to 12 conclude that conversation and verses 13, 20 are God's promises. It could be summarized by saying God's promises bring hope. In times past, there were few written codes for people to follow. In those days, a handshake was considered a person's contract and signature. Rather than having documents and contracts with multiple signatures and notarized stamps, uh, a person's per word was his or her bond. Those who don't, who didn't keep their word, uh, risk social uh, outcasts. They were uh, not believable, um, and they were shunned by society they were known as dishonest or liars. The Bible occasionally depicts the keeping of contracts or the honoring of promises in a similar way. In the Old Testament, people might seal a deal by making a vow to the Lord. A Bible dictionary defines a vow as a voluntary promise to God to perform some service or do something pleasing to him in return from some hoped for benefit. And you can find examples of that in Genesis 28, 22, 22, Judges 11, uh, verse 30. Uh, a vow could be made to abstain from certain things. Um, the law demanded that those who uttered a vow be bound by it. And that's in Numbers uh, chapter 30. Um, but, but what about God's promises? The answer is found in today's lesson. Today's lesson is titled Full Assurance. The word assurance means a positive declaration intended to give confidence, a promise. In other words, a promise. It could mean confidence of mind or manner. Logos defines assurance in this way, a sense of confidence security or certainty, especially concerning one's salvation. The word for means containing or holding as much as possible, having no empty space, not lacking or emitting anything complete. With God's promises, we are lacking nothing. Hebrews 6.11 starts a discourse on God's assurance of hope. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, the things that accompany salvation, though we, th though we thus speak. When you see the word but, it is a contradiction of what was just stated. They were being called to spiritual growth. The previous verses, which are not part of today's lesson, but I'm going to mention them anyway, uh, to give some context, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6, 
the writer is saying is time to grow to mature, grow to be more mature in Christ, to move to a deeper understanding of Christ. In verses four through eight, there is a warning about those that fall away. In verse nine, we see this transition to the assurance of hope. There are better things for the Christian. If we stand fast, we won't fall away. We will grow in Christian maturity. We will become more confident in the promises of God. Many people fall away because they either stopped or never believed the promises of God. Verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Having declared that the promise of, of, of better things, the writer transitions to speaking of one who makes the promise. God is used, uh, who makes the promise, God. In using the description of not unrighteous, the writer employs a form of rhetoric known as litus. This device occurs when a writer or speaker creates a um, an understatement by expressing an affirmative by means of a negative to the contrary. In other words, we might affirm that something is good by declaring it is not bad. Therefore, the fact communicated here is that God is righteous. The promise of God's righteousness is connected with his unwillingness to forget. The recipient of this letter had ministered in ways that visibly uh, witness uh, to their salvation. It, it was a visible outcome of their salvation, the fact that they were ministering. It was visible. Um, we know that good works result from salvation. They don't result in salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. Jesus has said that the world would know, know his followers by their love for one another. The love we demonstrate is for or should be a result of the grace and forgiveness we received in Christ. Uh, I like First John, the fourth chapter. It says that if Christ died for us, the least we can do is love one another. The phrase showed toward uh, his name harmonizes with the imperative that ministry is to be done as though doing it to Christ himself. See Matthew 25 and 40. The author uses past and present tense verbs, have minister and do minister to acknowledge the work of believers. From this, we can conclude that the recipient of this letter were consistent in living out their faith. Amen. People are watching us. They see what we do and they judge us by that. Part of our assurance is how we live, how we treat other people. And we desire, verse 11, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. The writer's connection, uh, the writer's concern for consistent and continuous care continues. This was not only for the benefit of the one receiving the care, but also evident of the recipient's full assurance of hope so that they do not get discouraged in their work. We must never forget that ministry blesses the recipient and the one doing the ministry. We are known by our works. Verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promise. The opposite of being diligent is being slothful or negligent or lazy. Uh, the underlying Greek word occurs in only two places in the New Testament, here and in Hebrews 5.11. There the translation is the word dull, found in a context that warns against failing to hear. We know that a failure to listen will sometimes result in a failure to act accordingly. The author hopes that the readers will both hear and minister according to the truth. The author of Hebrews 
realizes that the reader may not may need more than a pep talk. Thus, the reader are encouraged to follow the example of those who have been faithful in ministry. As Christians, we should strive to be the best Christian we can be to set the standard of what it means to be a Christian. When I teach deacons, this is something I always say, that as leaders in the church, we can look back how we were treated and then think how we could have been treated better and, and implement those things. We should be the standard. You know, and the same thing when somebody meets us as a Christian, we should set the standard of what it means to be a Christian. And we should set that standard high so that people know us by our works, by our word, that we can be trusted, that we care, and that we do this not for our own glory, but for the glory of God. For when God made, verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no, neither, no greater name, he swear by himself. I really love that verse. Uh, the patriarch Abraham is mentioned by name 10 times in the book of Hebrews. Clearly, he is a biblical figure of, uh, to this writer. Even so, the emphasis here is on God who made a certain promise to that man. The promise in view is found in Genesis 22, 15 through 18. Before we dive into the nature of that promise, uh, we note that making a vow or swearing an oath is virtually the same thing. Psalms uh, 132 depicts the two actions in parallel lines. And you can compare Numbers 30 uh, and 2 in chapter in verse 10. It was permissible in the Old Testament era to swear by the name of Israel's God because he is the only true God, Deuteronomy 16, uh, Deuteronomy 6.13. Thus, when God himself makes a promise or swears an oath, he must swear by himself because no one greater in the universe exists by which to swear. The original reader would have been encouraged by this reminder that God that God's promises are assured since his unsurpassed greatness confirms them. The fact that vows are not necessarily sinful in and of themselves in the New Testament era is established in Acts 18 and 18, which records Paul taking a vow. But this taking of vows well, and swearing of oaths were widely misused in the first century. As human tradition displaced God's word, the result was self-serving oaths and vows. Jesus condemned such a practice in no uncertain words. Verse 14, saying, surely, blessings, I will bless thee and multiply I will multiply thee. And verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured, he attained the promise. The quotation from Genesis 22, 15, the promise from God was that through Abraham, uh, a vast number of descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed, which Abraham was when Abraham was in Haram. God promised him many descendants, uh, stressed anew. God began fulfilling that promise 25 years later when the 100-year-old Abraham had a son named Isaac. And Isaac is the son of promise, not his other son that he had out of wedlock. The staggering result, some 620 years later, is seen in Numbers 1 and one, chapter 1, verses 1 through 46. And what it's describing is when they went in to Egypt, they went in with less than 100. And when you count the men, women, children, uh, babies, however you want to count it, they came out with over a million. So that's a blessing, all descendants of Abraham. Abraham's main task during those 25 years was to wait patiently as such would demonstrate it, as such would be demonstrated his trust in God. The man's patience uh, wore along through 
the conception and birth of Ishmael, the illegitimate son. Uh, but in God's timing, the promise was indeed fulfilled as Abraham uh, learned patience over the course of an additional 14 years into the birth of Isaac. As with other cases in the Bible, God's intent was eventually uh, distorted by self-serving human tradition and pride. By the first century AD, a widely held belief was that physical uh, was that physical descendant from Abraham was the ticket to being right with God. But the more important issue was to be a spiritual descendant of Abraham. See Romans 4, 9 through 17, chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, and Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. For many, uh, verse 16, for men verily swear, by the greater, and an oath for, conf uh, for confirmation is to them an end to all strife. This verse reflects Exodus 22, uh, verses 10 through 11. A person swearing an oath in that context was inviting God to witness the truth of the testimony. Ideally, this served to put an end to the strife of the case at hand. The compelling idea here is that people take oaths in light of something or someone who is the greater, and there is nothing or no one greater than God. When a man says, I swear, he is trying to validate or prove that what he is saying is true. He swears to convince you. He then tries to bring in others to convince you that he is telling the truth by swearing on their name or memory, even if he is lying. But when God makes a promise, you can count on it. When God swears by himself, you can count on it. Um, God is not a man that he should lie. In verse 17, we'll talk more about that. Wherein God willingly, uh, verse 17, wherein God willingly more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That word in, in mutability means God is unchanging. In taking the oath, God communicated on the level of humanity's understanding at the time. He did so in order that there would be no doubt regarding his intention and commitment to implement his plan. This resolve is reflected in the phrase immutability of his uh, counsel. The word immutable means unchanging. The underlying Greek word occurs in the New Testament only and in this verse and in the next uh, verse. Verse 18, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for the refuse to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And this right here, what I'm going to read to you, comes directly from the commentary. It says, a trick question, uh, a trick question sometimes asks the Christian is, do you believe that God can do anything. The trap is that there is, uh, that if the response is no, that the Christians has admitted to the following, uh, to following a deity who is less than uh, omnipotent. And the word omnipotent means all powerful. But if the answer is yes, then the Christian can be asked uh, a follow up question, such as, so you believe that God can make two plus two equal seven. Uh, now we're going to get into the immutability of God. The correct response to the first question is to state that God cannot do anything with that, that would violate his own nature. God is the one who created all the rules that order the universe. This fact reveals him to be a God of order, not disorder. Regarding the second question, 
to uh, violate a rule that requires two plus two to always equal four will be for God to violate his own orderly nature. This is not a sign of weakness. In fact, quite the opposite. In the verse at hand, we see an affirmation of all, all, uh, of all of this in the fact that it is impossible for God to lie. That is of the two, this is one of the two immutable things in view in the verse at hand. The second of those two things is that God sealed the promise with an oath. As already discussed, we should not lose sight of the fact that it is important that it that an important goal of the writer to prevent the reader from falling away from Christ. Hebrews chapter six, verses four through six. The stress on the uh Absolute reliability of God's promises serve to achieve this goal. Verses 19 through 20. Which hope we have as an author of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into the entereth into and with and within the veil, whether the forerunner for us enter even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Michelle today. These two verses are our key scripture, uh, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil whether the forerunner is for us entered even jesus made a high priest for us the focus on hope continues as the author weaves metaphors together to illustrate the message anchors uh, bring to mind thoughts of stability this verse is the only verse is the only instance in the New Testament where anchor is used to illustrate Christian hope. The second metaphor involves the temple veil. The veil is the temple in Jerusalem served to divide the areas. As the writers later, as the writer later notes, um, behind the second veil was the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or or Rules for going into the Holy of Holies um, uh, place were highly restrictive. Um, and, the, and the rules can be found in Leviticus chapter 16 and then compared again in Hebrews chapter 9. The gospel records the temple veil was torn from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross. Thus, Jesus was in some way, some sense, the forerunner for us in that regard. The writer of Hebrews explains this further in Hebrews 10, 19 through, 21, 19 through 25. The primary reference in the Old Testament to the mysterious Meshedadak is in Genesis chapter 14 through 18, uh, with another one found in Psalms 104 and 10. Um, the writer closes this section of the book of Hebrews by reflecting on the imagery of this Psalms as he did earlier in Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verses 6 and 10. I uh, want to read a little bit more about Michelle Dedeck. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 7. You know, Jesus is our high priest. Uh, he became that high priest for us. We have direct access to God now through Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, it says the veil was written to or tore into, um, and now we have direct access to God. Before that, and um, the, the high priest was the only one who could go into the Holy of Holies. Uh, all the priests went into the outer room, which was referred to as the sanctuary, to do their priestly duties. In the Holy of Holies uh, was certain things. Uh, one of them was the Ark of the Covenant. 
Uh, that's where it sat. In the Ark of the Covenant was, was a bowl of manna, uh, was Aaron's bud, uh, Aaron's rod that budded. Um, and uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant could not be touched. Men were not to touch it. You touched it, you would die. In order to transport it, there were uh, these uh, rings on it. You stuck poles in it and you did it. There's a description of somebody touching it and dying it. You know, so this place represented a place where God met men and and, and relieved them or, or forgave them of the sins. So when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he could only go in there one time a year and, and offer the atonement for sin, for his sins, and for ours. So that's what he went in there for. That blood was poured on the mercy seat, which was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where... Uh, we were forgiven of our sins, but only for a time. It couldn't last. But what Jesus did, did last. It was forever. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he died once for all of our sins so that he don't, he don't have to die every year. He don't have to die multiple times a year. He died once and for all, for all of our sins. So in conclusion, when God promised Abraham that his offspring would bless all nations, that was the beginning of Abraham's covenant. It was a promise that reached beyond Abraham's immediate descendants to encompass the entire world. The fulfillment of the promise lay in the work of Jesus on the cross. Once humanity's debt of sin was paid, no further payment was required. That means that we are invited to be heirs to the promise, not to, not to be the purchaser of the promise. The question is whether or not we can live out this life changing truth. To live this truth means that we rest in the work of Christ and cease trying to redeem that which we have already inherited through faith. Um, and that goes back to what was being said in, in um, Hebrews chapter 5, where we see this discourse begin, actually in chapter 6, verse 1, you know, he's telling them, it's time for y'all to move forward. Quit uh, trying to get reassurance in the things which you already should be assured in. So, and there's a difference between assurance and reassurance. When we, one can almost say that always seeking reassurance lacks faith you know, is a sign of lacking faith. But when we have assurance, we believe what God has told us. I believe that if we're going to have assurance in the hope, then we ought to have assurance in the promises and we ought to know the promises of God. How can we have assurance if we don't know the promises of God? We have the promise of God's love. God demonstrated his love for us by giving us the most extravagant gift possible, the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus accepted our punishment and paid the price for our sins and then offered us the new life he bought for us. He willingly gave up the comforts of heaven so that we might receive God's love. This world will, this world will disappoint us but God's love never will. The promises of his love is available to everyone at no additional cost. Our only burden is to accept it. The promise of forgiveness. Jesus as shepherd will search in the hills for the one lost sheep. God pursues every human being he has ever created. The promise of purpose. The promise of instruction. The promise of immortality. That uh, the promise of freedom, the promise of inner peace, sin, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and numerous other forces are at war within us. But the peace of God moves into the heart and mind of every believer to, re to restrain these hostile forces and offer comfort in place of conflict. Unlike worldly peace, Christ's peace does not involve any fear. It is only possible because of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension for those who believe he is the Son of God. Peace comes from trusting that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are active, actively at work and completely in control. 
the promise of joy, the promise of intimacy, the promise of provision, the promise of Jesus' continued presence, the promise of recognition, the promise of Christ's commission, the promise of power, the promise of Christ's influence, the promise of responsibility, the promise of God's grace. Jesus taught a parable about workers in a vineyard to explain the kingdom of heaven. Interest is by God's grace alone. The promise of abundance, the promise of fruitfulness, the promise of urgency, the promise of the rapture. When Jesus Christ returns, his arrival will be sudden and unexpected. Anyone who knows him as their savior will be raptured to heaven. Everyone else will experience the tribulation. In the meantime, every Christian can share the gospel to the end of the earth through the limitless power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is holding you back. You have to have the courage, boldness, confidence, insight, ability, authority, fulfill your mission. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit will full, full fuel your ministry into Christ returns or calls you home. The promise of answered prayer, the promise of Christ's return, the promise of the end times, the promise of heaven. There's a song that a deacon sings on the prayer line, and the name of that song is Heaven Must Be a Beautiful Place. The promise of eternal rewards. Consider the most powerful or well-known people in the world, how many got where they are today by being humble, self-effacing, and gentle. Not many, but in the life to come, the last will be first. It is impossible to give up more for the kingdom than you will receive in return. The promise of eternal security. And to me, that's what this message of hope is, this assurance of hope, the promise of eternal security. Anyone who has ever purchased a defective product knows the term lifetime warranty, usually means something different to the manufacturer than it does to the consumer. There are often exclusions for component parts, normal wear and tear, and failure to follow the manufacturer's instructions. Yet Jesus offers us a better warranty than we could imagine. His eternal promise contains no loopholes or exclusion. He willingly extends it to all who believe in them. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believe in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Psalms 23, we can have assurance in that. And that's a song that we all know. I like the way it reads in the New Living Translation. It starts out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. And it concludes by saying you uh, that uh, surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. If we believe Psalms 23 and 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I have no want. We don't have to want for nothing because Jesus Christ gives us everything, beginning with eternal life. We see the promise he made. In, in John chapter 14, starting at verse 1, he said, For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. We can rest assured 
that if he prepared a place for us, he's coming back again to receive us so that we can be where he is. Uh, that concludes my lesson for today. And I open it up to uh, questions, comments, concerns. Good morning. Good morning, sir. That was such a blessing. Thank you very much. Uh, took us on a spiritual journey and a historical analysis. Thank you so much. God bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you, Joe, for the great lesson. Thank you for reminding us of all the promises. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's over here preaching the promises. He, he was trying to give you a keyboard. <laughs> or, um, the promise. <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> but it was a great lesson remind us of all the things that god has promised us he's done the work for us we just must accept the gift that he's given um and he's the anchor only anchor we can hold strong to like he was um bound in, in his and his glory and his grace um no matter what we we have we face on the side we know that he he's a comforter yes. he's our, our our lord our shepherd our king our or everything yeah. without him we have nothing um I've, and it's our job our duty as christians to show forth every non-believer that they are not lost they just need to go back home um but thank you for a great thank lesson thank you sir you know um when i studied this lesson I, the the key word came out to me was anchor so in other words, we have to keep our souls anchored in the word of God. And this message was to those that believe. God is telling us to not set our uh, affections on, um, on, not on things of the earth, but things of the heavens. And that when life comes and it, it, you feel like you've dealt been dealt a bad hand. We must still hold on to God and and remember that when Christ died on the cross, He said it is finished, and that's what He meant. It is finished. So, whenever we as believers ever feel like we're we're in doubt, all we have to do is. Go, go into the word and God affirms all his promises. But like, like Brother Miller said, if you don't know the promises, how are you going to have hope? So you have to study and let the word speak to you and give you that anchor that you need in order for you to deal with life here on earth. It was a wonderful lesson. And to some of the things that you said only confirm what God had told me when I studied the lesson. Amen. Uh, good morning, Deacon Miller. Uh, great lesson. Uh, you brought out a lot of information. But for me, I have a different twist on this lesson. And mainly uh, it comes from Verse 13 and 16, as God promised us, <clears throat> when we give our word to someone else, we should try to keep it. Um, yeah. This lesson reminds me of James 512. Yeah. You know where I'm going. Yes, sir. But above all things, my brother, swear not, neither by the heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. These we fall into condemnation. So when we promise somebody something, we should try our very best to complete that promise. Or we become liars if we don't. And I, I just want to bring that part out. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. And that's very important because, your calendar. you know, we, we say things all the time. And, and like I was saying in the lesson, you can tell, you know, when somebody's really trying to convince you that their lie is the truth because they start swearing. And, you know, they, I, I, I swear, you know, uh, you know, they swear on their mother, their father, their brother, their sister. And, and 
the more they lying, the more risk they're willing to put there. You know, I swear on my mother who's dead, you know, you know, I swear on her grave. You know, the more outrageous it becomes, the more obvious it is a lie. So what what does it say to me about me if that I had to go through that type of uh, rigmarole to convince you that I'm telling the truth? You know, my words should be good for you because I have demonstrated in the past. And that's the beauty of God's word. He has demonstrated it over and over that his word is true, that he's immutable, that he don't change, that he don't lie. But we will do what we must do to get what we want. And, and I should live in such a way that if I tell you, I'm going to pick you up at 12 o'clock, you can count on me picking you up at 12 o'clock. And if I can't get there at 12 o'clock, I ought to be, I'm not, not, not wait to 12 o'clock to call you. I ought to call you as soon as I know I'm going to be late, you know, but how often do we do that? So you want percent right. We have to live as honest brokers. But you gotta remember too now, monkey see, monkey do. That's what we would. That's what we were. Well, um, you know, when you're the natural man, you you know, it's it's just like when people say, "May God add a blessing to the reading of His word." His word is already blessed. You don't have to say that. But in the meantime, people say things and they don't know why, and they pass it down. And you gotta remember too that we have a. Our culture has come from, um, it was against the law to read, learn how to read. So a lot of things was passed along through through conversations. And so they took it as, what, the law. So a lot of things we, we do from influence. Think about it. Mm -hmm. It comes from what? The one that's in charge of the, of of this world. What you say and what we do, but um, people can see who you're serving by the way you act and what and your conversation or the influence you have on them. That's why it's so important. We as believers, we need to set the best example um, when we're dealing with Christians and non Christians, because we may be the only Bible somebody may ever see. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. All right. We'll talk about next week's lesson. Next week's lesson. Let's see. I just had it up here. Y'all yeah, forgive me. Uh, who's teaching next week? Um, um Don. It should be Don. Okay. All right. I had to talk to a confirmant, but it should be done. Okay, so next week's lesson is fearless, uh, fearless witness. Um, the devotional reading can be found in Philippians chapter three, verses one through fourteen. The background scripture is Acts chapter twenty-six, one through eleven, and the lesson scripture is Acts twenty-six, one through eleven. Um, Pastor Echoes, yes, great lesson, Joe. Thank you. I was you had a lot of promises there. I was feel like a little hoop there. But hey, brother, I had to stop. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> Especially when I get to uh, 14, John 14. You yeah. know, uh, one of my favorite songs uh, by Jennifer Hudson is Jesus Promised Me a Home over there, which is based on that scripture. Amen. Amen. Father, we're so grateful for the promises. We, we live on promises. We walk on your promises. We walk on... Your simple word, like Peter did, you said, come, and Peter walked through the water. We're walking on your promises and standing on the premises, Lord, that you've given us a word, no matter what we see, no matter what we hear, our hearts and our lives head to your word for our shelter, protection. We thank you for the word, oh God. We count on it for everything. Our life is based on it. Our joy is uh, tied to it. Our souls are anchored in it. And we thank you, Father, for a sure foundation, a sure anchor. A sure hope that goes beyond and enters the veil where Jesus Christ is himself. We can come boldly to your throne room and make our request known to you. We're so grateful, God, for the privilege of being your children today. Look on our lives, Nick, uh, individually, our individual lives with God. And help us, oh God, to be more like you in all things, in thought, word, motive, and deed. And then look on us collectively. Help us to join together to lift your name up in a way that will cause someone to come to know you. 
And we thank you for your many blessings. So we commit the Sunday school ministry to you and each ministry, each church to you that's here and each church home that's represented here, God. Let, let the word go forth to the blessing of your people this day, to save your souls, to the healing of broken bodies. We thank you for being able to hear, um, to see Tony and know that he's doing well. Continue to keep your hand of mercy upon his life. And we pray, God, for the doctors. It's so good to hear Dr. Clarice on this morning and hear her voice, to know that you're in the healing business, that you're still working on her body. Continue to touch. Good to hear this morning, Deacon JJ, who's going through. God, keep the hand of mercy and healing upon his life. And we thank you for your blessing. We believe prayer works. So we call upon your name over and over again. We're going to trust you until we see the results of what you're going to do in their lives. We thank you for these things and commit all thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Walk with the King. I'll see you all next week. God bless you. Stand on the promises of God. God bless.